The chapter of Salat al Jumu'ah. And Salat al Jumu'ah, Kullu man lazimathu al Maktuba, lazimathu al Jumu'ah. Everyone who is required to pray the five salawat is also required to pray the Jumu'ah with conditions. What are the conditions? In kana mustawtinan bibina. If this person is living in a city, bina, city. If he's living in a village, he's living in a qariya. Bina means physical structures. In contrast to tent structures. You know, the Bedouins are moving. Right? So every time they would move, they would set up 20, 30, 40 tents. Then they're going to stay there a few days, they're going to move on. So in those days, they had tribal Bedouins. Those Bedouins who are constantly on the move, Juma is not wajib for them. When is Juma wajib? In kana mustawtinan bibina. If the person is living in a bina, is permanent settlement. Mustawtin means he's not musafir. Mustawtin, he has taken resident. And we talked about safar last time. So this is the resident in a actual city. وَبَيْنَ الْجَامِعِ فَرْسَخٌ فَمَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ And between him and the masjid is the distance of a farsakh or what is lesser than that. Now, uh, a farsakh it was a, a measurement of a unit of measurement, uh, and it was preserved in, in English literature as the term league. The farsakh is the English league. So there's a famous book, Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. That league is the farsakh, uh, and uh, the farsakh still remains in some civilizations. Uh, I think Afghan, and even in uh, Urdu and Hindi, par- parlang or something like this. There's some farlang. The farlang is the farsakh. Okay, so that is what uh, this, the, the term farsakh is still there uh, It's still used It is a distance of unit And in those days the distances were not measured The way we measure miles and kilometers Down to a precise centimeter It was an average measurement A rough idea How many footsteps and what not So that level of farsakh uh, They don't have any evidence for this It's just a matter of what is a reasonable distance So for us we can extrapolate and say Anything that is a reasonable drive when you're living in a settlement, an actual permanent settlement, Jumu'ah would be wajib upon you. Except for who? إِلَّا الْمَرْأَةُ وَالْعَبْدُ وَالْمُسَافِرُ وَالْمَعْذُورُ بِمَرَضٍ أَوْ مَطَرٍ أَوْ خَوْفٍ Okay. Who is Jumu'ah not wajib on? Number one, the female. Okay. The female. By unanimous consensus, Jumu'ah is not obligatory. There is no difference of opinion. None of the madahib have made Jumu'ah obligatory on the woman. And that is because the Sharia does not really have any obligations on the woman for public rituals. Except for Eid and even Eid is an ikhtilaf. And some of the madahib say that it is not wajib on the woman even to go for Eid. And other madahib say it is wajib for the woman to go for Eid. But the point being the Sharia never obligates these public rituals of the salah on the women in terms of the daily salawat or in terms of the uh, Jumu'ah. And there is a hadith in this regard that scholars have considered to be slightly weak, but they have all acted upon it even though it is weak. And the hadith is in Abu Dawood. Al-Jumu'atu haqqun wajibun ala kulli muslimin illa arba'a mamluk aw imra'a aw sabi aw marid. The hadith is weak, yet all madahib took it. Not because of the hadith, but because of the concept that the hadith mentions is authentic. And that is, Jumu'ah haqqun wajibun ala kulli muslim. Everybody should understand this much. Illa arba'a, except for four. Mamluk, the slave. Imra'a, the woman. Sabi, the child. Marid, the sick. So even if the hadith is not authentic, which it is not authentic, the concepts in it are clearly proven by many other concepts in the sharia. The sick person, the child, we don't obligate on them. The slave, we don't obligate coming to the public prayers. And then the woman as well, we do not obligate on the woman. So the woman is exempt from the obligation of Jumu'ah. Of course, they can come, but they are not obliged to come. Wal'abd, the slave as well, is not obliged. Uh, and the slave, uh, the, shed, the fiqh of slave is um, something, as I mentioned, uh, not relevant to us anymore. Nonetheless, it's something that is found in every single book of fiqh. 
and every chapter of fiqh always mentions the different rulings between the hur and the abd. So the abd is also not obliged to go. The musafir is not obliged as well. The musafir is not obliged as well. And this means that the one who is musafir, even when he gets to a city, as long as he is musafir, we talked about this last week. What is the definition of musafir? So suppose your company sends you, let's be out of the khilaf and say three days. For sure you're not musafir, you're not going to break safar in three days. All madahib say three days, is you're still musafir. Okay? Remember the ikhtilaf, four days and more and 15 days and Ibn Taymiyyah's position. Everybody would say three days you are still musafir. Correct? Suppose your company sends you to a major city, St. Louis, New York, Chicago, and Thursday, Friday, Saturday is what your company sends you. Many Muslims feel, oh, it's Friday, I have to go pray. You can. Nobody's stopping you. And it's good if you do. But it is not wajib. It is not wajib because you are a musafir. And you are not mustawtin bibina. And this is pretty much all of the madahib would say, the four madahib would say this as well, that when you are musafir. Now, if you are not musafir, we talked about this last week, if you're staying uh, more than 15 days, for example, then you are not musafir, and so you will be, uh, you will have to find Jumu'ah and pray Jumu'ah uh, in that uh, city. Or if you follow the other position of four days, or if you follow Ibn Taymiyyah's position, whatever position you follow, once you have decided you are not musafir, then you must pray Jumu'ah even if you're temporary in a city. Okay? So, إِلَّا الْعَبْدُ وَالْمَرَى musafir wal ma'dur And somebody who has an excuse to not come to Jumu'ah. Who is the one who has an excuse? Well, he gives some examples, but the reality is there are more than this. Marad, matar, khawf. He gives three examples. Severe rain, sickness, or fear. And we have many other examples. So, simple example. You get in to go for Jum'ah, you start your car, your battery is dead. And Jum'ah is 20-30 minute drive away, and you don't have a ride. This is an excuse. Udur. Now, if you had a ride, if you're able to arrange it, obviously it is wajib. But if you cannot, then udur. So this is what he means. Someone who has a legitimate excuse as well, Jum'ah would be lifted from this person. And the classical excuses are a sickness. If you're too sick to come, you're too sick to drive yourself and you have nobody to take you, your fever is too high, Jum'ah is forgiven uh, upon you. Khawf as well. So khawf means you are, you are fearful. Fearful, again, uh, may Allah protect all of us, but there are many cities now in Syria and what places going out of your houses is a problem. Could be. Yemen, what's happening now, could be a problem. It's just safer to stay at home. So is Jumu'ah wajib in those cases? Obviously not. So these are exemptions for Jumu'ah. وَإِنْ حَضَرُوهَا However, if these last group of people come, sorry, if any of these people come, sorry, in this case, the mar'ah, the woman, the abd, the musafir, the ma'adhur. If they come, ajza'athum. It is sufficient for them. It's good for them. Nothing wrong. It's ja'iz. Walam tan'aqid bihim. But jumu'ah is not counted by them. Now what does this mean we're going to come to? Okay? For them to come is ja'iz. But the jumu'ah congregation does not count them. What does this mean? We'll come to in the next page. Okay? إِلَّا لِمَعْذُورٍ إِذَا حَضَرَهَا وَجَبَتْ عَلَيْهِ وَنَعَقَدَتْ بِهِ However, if the one who had an excuse somehow manages to come, it is now wajib once he is there, and his presence will count. So, suppose you didn't have a car, your car broke down, and you said, خلاص, I cannot go. Okay, so you went back home. At that point in time, Jumu'ah is not wajib. Okay, so then you think, hey, hold on a sec, maybe that guy, he comes by my house Towards this direction, maybe I'll call him up. You didn't remember this when you thought it, uh, when you first found out. You th- think of it. You call the guy. He picks you up. Now it is wajib for you, and your presence in the masjid will count for the congregation. What does it mean? Will count. Will come to in a while. So, the musafir, according to the Hanbali madhab, the musafir and the woman and the abd, their presence is ja'iz, but it doesn't count for the congregation. Whereas the one who has a legitimate excuse, once he is able to come, his presence becomes wajib and it counts in the congregation. Now, what does it mean count in the congregation? 
one of the preconditions for Jumu'ah to be obligatory as well. وَمِن شَرْطِ صِحَّتِهَا Of the shurut of Jumu'ah, number one, فِعْلُهَا فِي وَقْتِهَا It should be prayed in its time. Number two, فِي قَرْيَةٍ In a village or an inhabited land. Because Jumu'ah is not prayed by the Bedouins. Jumu'ah is not prayed by continual musafirs. You do not pray Jumu'ah. This is the standard position of the madhahib. Now the question arises, if they were to do Jumu'ah, is that jaiz? And um, majority of madhahib would say, no, they should not do Jumu'ah even. But another position says, if they do it, that is permissible. And in the circumstances we find ourselves in America, this is what we encourage people to do. So simple reality, our high school students, for example, okay, our high school students, technically, most of the books of fiqh would say, that if they cannot come to the masjid, there is no Jumu'ah for them. This is technical fiqh. But there's something called basically minority fiqh, fiqh al-aqalliyat, where you look at the situation we find ourselves in and you can fine-tune. And we understand that our high school kids, it is excellent tarbiyah for them to be taught to pray Jumu'ah. And they should be taught that they should take off Friday afternoons. And they should be taught to give five-minute khutbahs. It's all good for them. So, to fine-tune fiqh and say, you know what, in this circumstance, it is good for high school kids to give Jumu'ah. Prisoners. Now, this book doesn't mention it, but the madhahib all agree there is no Jumu'ah on the prisoner. Now, imagine in an Islamic land. Why should the prisoners, you know, be told to come outside into the public? It's going to be a, a scandal. It's going to be a security threat. To have the murderers and the rapists whatnot coming to Jumu'ah and then back to the prison. Correct? Of course it's not going to happen. All of the books of fiqh say the prisoner is ma'dhur. He is forgiven from Jumu'ah. He doesn't pray Jumu'ah. And technically there will be no Jumu'ah just for prisoners because the masajid of the, of the city are there. But now in North America, what do we do? We say the prisoners should pray Jumu'ah. This is minority fiqh, fiqh al This is changing fiqh, looking at our circumstances. That technically there is no Jumu'ah for prisoners. Technically there is no Jumu'ah in high schools because shuroot of Jumu'ah is that it is done in a city that has a main masjid. There must be the primary masjid. Jumu'ah is done in the primary masajid, not even in the smaller masajid as we'll come to. The smaller masajid should shut down and only the larger masajid should have Jumu'ah. But who can do this anymore in the circumstances of North America? Yes, still, as we know, in the Middle East, in India, Pakistan, still to this day, the smaller neighborhood masjid shut down. And that is from the, from the Sharia. They should shut down. Okay? So then, what remains open? Only the larger masajid. So, of the conditions of Jumu'ah, we pray it at its time, fi waqtiha. What is the time of Jumu'ah? The Shafi'is, the Malikis, and the Hanafis, they say the time of Jumu'ah is the time of Dhuhr. So Dhuhr and Jumu'ah are the same. The only difference comes from the Hanbali Madhab, and that is the Madhab we are teaching in this book. The Hanbali Madhab says the timing of Jumu'ah is the same as the timing of Eid Salah. That you can pray Eid Salah begins at the beginning of Eid Salah. That it can come from the Eid till the end of Dhuhr Salah. This whole time is Jumu'ah. And this is the standard Hanbali position. That Jumu'ah is allowed before Zawal. And the other three madahib say no, Jumu'ah is allowed only after Zawal. Which is the timing of Dhuhr. Okay? And each of them have their, uh, have their um, uh, evidences. But the main evidence for the Hanbali Madhab is a hadith in Sahih Muslim. That... Anas ibn Malik, uh, or sorry, Jabir ibn Abdullah says that we would pray uh, Jumu'ah with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and then go back to our uh, camels and have them uh, rest until the sun uh, reached its zawal. Meaning Jumu'ah would finish and they would get to their camels before the zawal. Which means Jumu'ah is before the time of Dhuhr. Okay, and the other madahib say, well, Jabir is estimating, he's not actually saying that this is, or it could be a mistake on Jabir's part or whatever. So they have their interpretations and they don't accept the timing before Zawal. Um, nonetheless, the Hanbali madhab definitely allows it before the Zawal. And that is what I think most North American masjid as well also follow because it is very convenient 
in North America uh, in the summer once, uh, right? So for example, now, Dhuhr begins at 11.30, for example. It's very convenient if we can have Jumu'ah, uh, sorry, what am I talking, the opposite. In the summer months, Dhuhr goes very late, after lunchtime. And Jumu'ah, if we were to delay it till after lunchtime, uh, it will be very difficult. So we consistently pray it, let's say, at 1 o'clock. Even if Dhuhr begins at 1.30, 1.45, we will still pray it before. And the Hanbali Madhab allows it, and this is the position, I think, as well of many of the modern masajid here in North America. So, number one condition, you pray it and it's time. Number two, shart of Jumu'ah, it must be in a qariya. And by qariya, what is meant is that a permanent settlement is a qariya. This is what a qariya means. And the opposite of qariya is a non-permanent settlement. And the classic example, as we said, was the constant traveling of the Bedouins. Or you can imagine, let's say that there's a geological team searching for oil or searching for whatever. And they have a team of, let's say, 30, 40, 50 people. And their goal or their job, their occupation, they're on the road all the time for weeks on end, surveys. Is Jumu'ah going to be obligatory on them? No, even if they have large quantity because they are not in a qariya. So this is the second uh, shart. The third shart. وَأَنْ يَحْضُرَهَا مِنَ الْمُسْتَوْطِنِينَ بِهَا أَرْبَعُونَ مِنْ أَهْلِ وُجُوبِهَا Okay, so this is the uh, point that do they count for Jumu'ah or not? All of the madahib say there must be a minimum quantity for Jumu'ah. This is the standard position of all of the madahib. The Malikis typically say 12, the Hanbalis and Shafi'is say 40, and the Hanafis typically, and even within each madhab there are positions, they typically say uh, a large amount that fills basically the, the Jami' Masjid. The, the, uh, the amount that should be in a small qariya maybe, a small village. And sometimes they even also say 40, some say 100, some even say 120. So we have all of these positions and the four madahib by and large have 12 or 40. These are the two main numbers, 12 or 40. And they each have their various evidences. The fact of the matter is none of them is very, very strong. They're kind of derived evidences um, and they're nothing that is explicit in this regard. But the Hanbali madhab says 40, as does the Shafi'i madhab. So according to the Hanbali madhab, if there are 40 men, but what are the conditions of these men? They must be from the people who live in the town and upon whom Jumu'ah is wajib. Okay? And that is why the musafir doesn't count in the 40. Remember we talked about doesn't count. That's the point here. Okay? The abd doesn't count in the 40. Okay? The, 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 the woman does not count. So, I mean, if you had 39 men and 300 women, according to the Hanbali Madhab, there is no Jumu'ah. And the Shafi'i Madhab, and the Hanafi Madhab, there is no Jumu'ah. 39 men, that's how much? Four Sufu for our lines, right? Imagine, that's like, you know, that's, the, the, that's what the fiqh says. And the Hanafis will say even more men than, because they have, typically they have a small village quantity of men. So the Hanafis are the largest and the Malikis are the smallest. Now, there are other positions as well. Ibn Taymiyyah, for example, says there's no evidence for any of these numbers. Three is the minimum. So Ibn Taymiyyah says three. And there are even some scholars who say two, as I said. Okay, uh, I mentioned this, I think, last week or something. Uh, nonetheless, I think three is a safe number. And if there are two... Uh, just pray, pray Dhuhr then. Pray Dhuhr. Even though technically maybe it's Ja'iz, just go ahead and pray Dhuhr. So three seems to be Aqal al jamaa the minimum amount that is a plurality. There's no evidence for 12 or 40 or whatnot. So then where, 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 does, where do we have to go to? We have to go to language that what is Aqal al jumaa Aqal al jamaa fi Jumu'ah. Right? What is Aqal al jamaa What is the minimum quantity that we can say this is Jama'a? Of people because Jumu'ah means the gathering of people. So what is Aqal al jamaa Is it two or three? And this is a classic ikhtilaf of the Lughawiyin, of the linguist. And in the end of the day, as I said, inshallah, it's a very, very rare scenario whether it's two or three. But the point is, inshallah, with three people, you can also have uh, Jumu'ah. And as I said as well, 
looking at the modern world we live in, we shouldn't be that strict about it has to be ahl qarya mustawtinun, that it doesn't have to be that way. That the fact of the matter is because we are not living in an Islamic civilization, we should encourage the praying of Jumu'ah, even if technically some fiqh books would not allow it. So technically speaking, um, the people in the hospital, what is this, the hospital that has the musalla? What is, which one is it? The, v, the VA, VA hospital, mashallah. VA hospital, okay, okay. Vegetable juice is healthy, it's good for the hospital as well. Jayid, okay. So the VA hospital, technically speaking, they do not have a masjid. And the fiqh books would say they should pray dhuhr and not jum'ah. If they cannot make it in time, because according to fiqh books, you must be praying Jumu'ah in the Qariya, in the Masjid al-Jami'ah, in the major masjid. And we understand from an Islamic civilizational standpoint, right? Because from an Islamic civilizational standpoint, they didn't want small groups of Muslims to just pray by themselves and not come to the main masjid. But that's because even to this day in Muslim lands, everybody allows you to go pray Jumu'ah. Correct? That's the society is based that way. But living in the West, living in minority situations, we will have to fine-tune. And in cases where doctors or people in one place or whatever. Now, we have to be careful here. Suppose they could make it to a masjid. Then they are not allowed to be lazy and say, oh, we just want a longer lunch break and have some time to socialize. No. Because of the goals of Jumu'ah is that it be done fil masjid al-jami'. And masjid al-jami' means the larger masajid, not the neighborhood masajid, not the smaller musallayat. And this is all the madahib agree, that the smaller masajid should be shut for Jumu'ah. And only the larger, in fact, as we will mention uh, over here, uh, that, uh, so let's move on, so he's going to move on and say this. That, so, and of the conditions is that 40 of the mustawtinun, meaning those who are living in that city, must come upon whom Jumu'ah is wajib. So that's why, according to the Hanbali Madhab and the Shafi'i Madhab, if 30 locals came and 20 Musafir men came, there would be no Jumu'ah. This is what the fiqh books say. And now, of course, you will say, how do the people know they're Musafir or Mustawtin? Well, because when you're living in a small little village, everybody knows everybody. So when 20 strangers show up, you know they're strangers. And therefore, according to these books, people would literally be supposed to count if they are at that number of 40 or so. And if it's 40, they will pray. If it's not, they will not pray. And also of Jumu'ah, what is done is وَأَن تَتَقَدَّمَهَا خُطْبَةً فِي كُلِّ خُطْبَةٍ حَمْدُ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَالصَّلَاةُ عَلَى رَسُولِهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَقِرَاءَةُ آيَةٍ وَالْمَوْعِضَةٍ So the Hanbali say that before Salat al-Jumu'ah must be two khutbas. As for two khutbas, there is ijma' on this point that Salat, that Jumu'ah should have two khutbas. However, is it wajib or mustahab? This is where the madhahib differ. Is it wajib or is it mustahab? This is where the madhahib differ. But the concept of having two khutbas, alhamdulillah, there's no ikhtilaf. According to the Hanbalis, it is wajib. Which means if it is not done, then you have a Naqis khutbah, your khutbah is not done properly. And according to, I want to say the Malik, I'm not sure, it is mustahab. Just don't quote who it is, but according to the other method, it is mustahab. Uh, and fact of the matter is there's no evidence either way. All that we know, our Prophet always performed two khutbas. That was the sunnah. And therefore the ummah has taken the sunnah. And alhamdulillah, I don't know of any place in the world where one khutbah is given for Jumu'ah, this is the sunnah that has been taking place. Now, the Hanbali Madhab says, in each khutbah, there should be four things. This is the Hanbali Madhab. The Hanafis have different shafi, each one has different now. That what constitutes the khutbah. The Hanbali say, in each of the two, there must be hamdullah, some type of praise. Hamdullah doesn't necessarily mean alhamdulillah. Subhanallah counts as hamdullah. Hamdullah means some praise of Allah. Okay? La ilaha illallah is alhamdulillah. Some praise of Allah. Salah ala Rasulillah. Number two, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number three, at least one ayah has to be recited. And number four, some maw'idha, some advice. Some advice. Even if the advice is within the ayah, then it counts. But there must be some maw'idha. Now, 
This is the strictest of the four madhahib. Other madhahib have lesser than this. The Hanbalis are the strictest that you have to have these four in each khutbah. Other madhahib say that the hamd is wajib in the first khutbah and the salah in the second khutbah, for example. And others have permutations which are beyond the scope of our talk right now. But the point being, the Hanbalis are the most strictest and they say each khutbah has to have hamd and salah and ayah and mawidah. And therefore, the Hanbali scholars, if you listen to the khutbahs, they always have some reference to all of these things because that is the madhab. Okay? But the fact of the matter, inshallah, once again, we can say there's no evidence to be that strict. And inshallah, as long as hamd and basically as long as these are found within the whole khutbah, then inshallah the khutbah has been given. Okay? So according to the majority, a salah ala Nabi is wajib somewhere in the khutbah. And that is why we always say it in the second khutbah. Okay? And some maw'idah, some advice. So, and again, this is common sense because that's what the purpose of the khutbah is. And Allah Azza wa says in the Quran that Ya Yuladinamu Ida Nudi Asratu Miyom Jwati Fasau ila dhikrillah. So there must be some dhikr of Allah, that's where they get Hamdullah from. There must be some remembrance of Allah. And the purpose of this is tadkir or maw'idah, and therefore the Hanbalis have these four conditions. وَيُسْتَحَبُّ أَنْ يُخْطَبْ عَلَى مِنْبَر And وَيُسْتَحَبُّ أَنْ يَخْطُبَ عَلَى مِنْبَر And it is recommended, not wajib, that the khutbah be given on a minbar. None of the scholars said minbar is wajib. Minbar is. Why is this? Because obviously you are then seen by the public. And we learn from the authentic hadith that the Prophet ﷺ took a trunk as his minbar, then... Uh, when uh, more and more people came to the masjid, he wanted to hire a member, so he commissioned the building of a member. And he called for a carpenter. One of the ladies of the Ansar had a carpenter. And he called for the carpenter. And the carpenter came, and the Prophet said, Build for me a member with three steps. So the carpenter built a member of three steps. And therefore, it is something well known in the Sunnah that our Prophet had a member made of three steps. And as we all know, the first time he stood on that member, then the trunk began to cry. That's the famous story of the of the trunk. So it is it is encouraged to give the khutbah on the member. فَإِذَا صَعَدَ أَقْبَلَ عَلَى النَّاسِ فَسَلَّمَ عَلَيْهِمْ When he rises up to the member, the first thing he does, he turns around and says salam to the people, and then sits down until the adhan finishes. Then stands up and gives the khutbah, then sits down, then stands up and gives the second khutbah. Now, this procedure, alhamdulillah, no ikhtilaf amongst the madhahib. And we all know this from our cultures, from every madhab, the Maliki, Shafi'is, Hanafis, Hanbalis, everybody does this. That the imam rises up, turns to face the audience, says salam, sits down, the adhan, stand up, first khutbah, sit down, stand up, second khutbah, and then comes down and leads two raka'at in which he recites loudly. Okay? So far, so clear, and no need to comment because there is no ikhtilaf. Alhamdulillah. No scholar or no madhab disagrees with this procedure. فَمَنْ أَدْرَكَ مَعَهُ مِنْهَا رَكَعَةً أَتَمَّهَا جُمُعَةً وَإِلَّا أَتَمَّهَا ظُهْرًا Where does the khilaf come? What if he misses some of those raka'at? So he walks in late. The majority say, if he catches even one raka'ah of the two, then he has caught the jumu'ah. And this is the Hanbali madhab as well. One madhab doesn't say this, but that's beyond the scope. Again, we're going to stick with our madhab here. The Hanbalis say, if he walks in after the first rak'ah, but before the second rak'ah, so he catches the second rak'ah, he will then make up one rak'ah only, and he has caught Jumu'ah. So that is his Jumu'ah. Wa illa, if he doesn't catch the second rak'ah, so he walks in late for Jumu'ah, and the Imam has said, Sami Allahu liman hamida of the second rak'ah. Or the Imam is in the tashahud of the second rak'ah. Now he has not caught Jumu'ah. And this is the standard position as well of, of the majority of the madahib. In fact, I don't know of any ikhtilaf. I think all of them say this. That he should then pray how many raka'at? Four raka'at of dhuhr. Okay, so if he catches after the second ruku', then atammaha dhuhran. 
he will make it up as Dhuhr and not as Jumu'ah. Okay. وَكَذَلِكَ إِن نَقَصَ الْعَدَدْ أَوْ خَرَجَ الْوَقْتُ وَقَدْ صَلُّوا رَكَعَةً أَتَمُّوهَا جُمُعَةً وَإِلَّا أَتَمُّوهَا ظُهْرًا Now sometimes they have these nonsensical or illogical or very bizarre statements and this is the reality of fiqh, sometimes it doesn't make sense. If you are a strict Hanbali and you believe that the 40 number is required, what happens if during the salah, one person exits of the 40. Firstly, how will the imam even know? But anyway, so this is what fiqh is about. Sometimes fiqh has bizarre scenarios. And the point of these bizarre scenarios, you just understand them and then make qiyas for other situations. Okay, Especially if you are following the Hanbali Madhab to the letter. As for me, as you know, I am not a blind muqallid. I'm a respectful muqallid. I will respect most of the madhab, but sometimes we'll have to fine-tune. And these are one of the things we must fine-tune. There is no evidence for the number 40, or the number 12, or the number 120. There's no evidence whatsoever. These are all kind of derived numbers. Just like we talked about last time, the 48 miles, there's no evidence whatsoever that is explicit. It's very, very, um, what's it, whimsical or something, just very derived. So we say that, any case, for the Hanbali madhab, Suppose the adad went down, the number went down, or the time for Jumu'ah finished. So suppose for whatever reason they started Jumu'ah five minutes before Asr, for whatever reason. And in the middle of the Salah, the time finishes. Again, how will they be monitoring? But that's the point. If they have prayed one rak'ah before the 40 goes down to 39, or before Asr timing comes in, then what do they do? If they have caught the first rak'ah, then they will make it for Jumu'ah. It's fine. So suppose they had, mashallah, exactly 40. Mashallah, tabarakallah. And then, Nadim breaks his wudu, mashallah, tabarakallah, in the salah. Okay? The 40th one, mashallah, tabarakallah. And walks out during the salah. Destroys the whole Jumu'ah for us. But then he says, don't worry guys, it was after the ruku'ah. Then what happens? No, Jumu'ah, not Dhuhr. Jumu'ah. Jumu'ah. Because the first rak'ah was finished. Okay? Now, suppose it was before the first, sorry, after, uh, before the first rak'ah, before the first ruku'ah. In this case, Dhuhr. In other words, if the number did not complete for the first rak'ah, so they didn't even have one rak'ah with 40 people. Then according to the madhab, and this is the Shafi'i as well, I mean this would be the way that they are. They will not, they will not pray Jumu'ah and they will immediately convert to, to Dhuhr. Okay? I should recite Baqarah so he goes and comes back. Mashallah, good point. Mashallah. The what? Yes, so the imam will change the knee in the middle of the salah. As we said, it's somewhat bizarre. How will the imam know? But still, this is the madhab. And we teach it just so that we understand. This is what the fiqh books say. That is true for the shafi'i madhab. I do not know what they will say. You are absolutely right. The shafi'i madhab does not allow a change in niyyah. The hanbali madhab does allow a change in niyyah. The hanbali madhab does allow a change in niyyah. So the Hanbali Madhab, if the, the 40 becomes 39, you're allowed to change niyas. Okay? Or if Asr timing comes in, then you will pray Dhuhr timing. وَلَا يَجُوزُ أَن يُصَلِّي فِي الْمِصْرِ أَكْثَرَ مِنْ جُمُعَةِ إِلَّا أَن تَدْعُوَ الْحَاجَةُ إِلَى أَكْثَرَ مِنْهَا It is not allowed to pray more than one Jumu'ah in any city. Except if there is a dire need to do so. And this is standard in all of the Madhahib. The ideal is there should be one Jumu'ah in every city. But obviously, the cities become larger and larger. And so, the fiqh books say, the Masjid al-Jami' only. And not the Masjid of the localities and the suburbs. Because every city has the major Masajid. And every city has the small neighborhood Musallayat. Every Muslim society. This is, alhamdulillah, a part of our heritage. Alhamdulillah. You have the local little places, sometimes even in a shopping mall, one of them will be converted to the musalla, right? And that will be your local place. And then you have the purpose-built masajid, the big massive structures. 
And those are the places the Jumu'ah is prayed. So no Jumu'ah in any city more than what is necessary to do so. So this is all standard stuff. It is mustahab for whoever comes to for Jumu'ah that he performs ghusl. The four madhahib say it is mustahab to do ghusl. The zahiri madhahib said it is wajib to do ghusl. And some of the Hanbalis also say it is wajib to do ghusl. According to those madahib, even the Hanbalis have two positions. The majority position, which is our book as well, ghusl is mustahab. But the position that ghusl is wajib is also found in our uh, tradition. But uh, this is, as I said, the minority position. And one position says, and this is an interesting one, ghusl is wajib on the one who smells. But the problem comes, who's going to tell him he smells? Okay. <laughs> But still, there is a position. Ghusl is wajib on the one who stinks. And it is not wajib on the one who doesn't. It is mustahab. Okay? Um, and, in fact, this is authentically narrated. The evidence for this is very clear. Uh, that there is a hadith in Abu Dawud that the Prophet was giving the khutbah. And the people had just come from the marketplace after buying and selling their animals. And the ra'iha of their, basically, stench came and wafted into the masjid. And the Prophet said on the mimbar, he said, Law annakum, if only you were to do ghusl before you come for Jumu'ah. Okay, so from this, some have said that those who stink basically, it is more obligatory on them. And of course, it is common sense, by the way. It's common sense. It's a bit funny, but it's also common sense. The purpose, one of the purposes of taking a bath is that you don't irritate other people. Okay, and do realize in the society back then, taking baths was not that easy or common. Okay, the what? There was no deodorant as well. Very valid point, mashallah, tabarakallah. I will add, there is still no use of deodorant in most Muslim lands. Wallahu musta'an. But that's a separate issue altogether. So it is mustahab that he performs ghusl, that he puts on two clean thobes, like meaning the izar and the rida, meaning that's how they used to play, or any thobe that is clean. And he puts on perfume, and he comes early to the masjid, all of this is narrated from the Prophet system and all of the Madahib agree. Coming early has a lot of reward. Praying, uh, uh, putting on perfume, putting on good clothes. The Prophet system had a thobe he would wear for Jumu'ah and for Eid. Our Prophet system encouraged wearing tlib on the day of Jumu'ah. He encouraged uh, doing ghusl. He encouraged coming early. All of these are authentically narrated and alhamdulillah no ikhtilaf. And none of the ulama said it is wajib. These things are mustahab for Jumu'ah. And if he comes while the Imam is giving the khutbah, he does not sit down until he prays two raka'at and he prays them quickly. And this is the position of the Malikis, the Shafi'is, and the Hanbalis in contrast to the Hanafis who say he should sit down. Okay, so the three madahib say he should pray two raka'at and pray quickly. Yujizu fihima. Wala yajuzu al-kalamu wal imamu yakhtub. And it is not allowed for him to say anything while the imam is speaking. Except the only person who can talk is the imam and whoever the imam speaks to. And of course this is based on so many ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ saying something that to a person in the gathering and they will respond then. So if the imam says something to the person in the audience, then the audience member will respond. And this is something, for example, the man came during the khutbah and he sat down and the Prophet asked him that, have you prayed two raka'at? So he asked him a question in the khutbah. So obviously the man said, no, I haven't. So he responded. So the Prophet said, stand and pray and pray quickly. And this is where the three get their position from, that the one who comes in late should also pray two raka'at. As for the Hanifis, they did not consider this hadith to be uh, authentic. Uh, but the point being that some, uh, so there are also uh, some exceptions to this, and that is that if somebody needs to tell the Imam something, then it is also allowed for him to speak. If there's some type of emergency and the Imam needs to be informed, or some type of issue that must be brought to the Imam's attention then it is allowed for the person to say something and when he speaks, that will not count as interrupting his blessings of Jumu'ah. So, 
uh, we learned this, by the way, from which hadith? From the hadith in Sahih Bukhari, when a man came into the masjid, when the Prophet was giving the khutbah, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, we're suffering from a drought, and our animals are dying, and our children are starving. Make dua to Allah to cause rain to fall. And our Prophet did not rebuke him and said, how dare you interrupt my khutbah. Rather, he immediately made dua. And the scholars say this is because there was a dire need to that this be brought to the attention of the Prophet This is a Bedouin coming once a week to the masjid. And this is the only time he has. And so he literally interrupts the khutbah and brings it to his attention. Now in our situation or scenario, very, very realistic scenario, um, somebody can come and say, for example, that uh, uh, the space has run out, uh, or the, 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 uh, w- uh, the microphone has cut off in the sister side, for example. Okay? Somebody comes and informs the imam or the khatib, this will not constitute breaking the silence that he must have. Because this is for the maslaha of the people. Or uh, somebody can say, oh, there has been an accident, is there a doctor in the audience? Okay? This is again the maslaha is needed and therefore this is something that is allowed uh, to be said even if the imam is giving the khutbah. Okay? So this uh, we finish uh, Salat al-Jumu'ah. <laughs> تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رضا الرب تعود إلى رضا الرب